First Corinthians chapter six, we're going to start in verse 10. Uh, this morning, uh, what I'm going to speak to you about is the mystery of Christian liberty and authority. That's kind of an interesting title, mystery of Christian liberty and authority. As we come to this passage, I want to kind of give you a brief overview of the idea of what the children of God were dealing with at the time of Jesus and how Paul is picking up this theme. We're going to be focusing our attention specifically uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. But before we get there, we're going to just go over some stuff that's going on in the nation of Israel. So here we have Moses appear on human history. He gets the law of God. He gives it to the children of Israel. And as they receive the law, the purpose of the law, as we read later on in the Bible, was to reveal the nature of God, God's perfection, and the realization that man has fallen from that perfection. The law is now given to mankind. They believe that to have relationship with God, they need to be perfect in fulfilling the law, which everybody falls short of. And so there is this general sense of condemnation, shame, and a heaviness resting on the children of Israel. And they got relief by the sacrifices and the atonement of those sacrifices. And then when Jesus shows up on the scene, he does this once for all work to deal with the realization that we have fallen short. And because of that, he begins to bring this concept up in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, uh, Matthew 20, uh, 11, 28. Sorry, I forgot the last part of it. And he's talking to the children of Israel. And here's a people that feel the perfection or the weight of God's law, and they know they can never reach it. And he basically looks at them and says, Now, come unto me, all that are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. And that whole concept of weary and heavy laden was the idea of the law, the effect of the law, and then the teachers constantly reminding them of the law and the weight of them never feeling acceptable to God. Now, interesting enough, when we begin the work of what Jesus has done for us and we talk about the mystery of Christian liberty, the mystery becomes what has God truly done in regards to our relationship with him. And because now we do not live under the law, how should we live? Christian liberty, what, what does that actually look like? What does that actually mean? And you find that once Paul begins to develop what we now describe as the doctrine or the teaching of justification by faith, which means God is determined to make a declaration over your life that once he's chosen to forgive you, you never have to appear before him again and ever give an account for your life. He has decided to look at your past, your present, and your future and make a declaration, forgiven, uh, acceptable in my sight. My son has paid the full weight for it. And so there is such a liberty that comes to the soul of us once we understand this, that now we say, well, then everything should be, I can go back to doing whatever I want. The law is not over me anymore. And then there, when that hits the soul, there becomes a reality that people don't know how to live in regard to God anymore. What does it mean to be, have liberty? What does it mean that the law, I'm not under the law anymore? What does it mean that God is not going to judge me anymore? Should I just go back to everything that I've done? And this is what Paul is beginning to address with the people in the Corinthians because this would seem like an easy thing to resolve, but it actually isn't. Once you tell people that the law is not over you, they don't know how to live because we're so law-based in our thinking. In fact, would you guys admit it's easier to have a set of laws given to you so that you can have some kind of boundaries and guidelines to your life than saying God has none of that over you? And so there's a tendency in us to go back to ourselves, go back to the law, and look at each other and say, are you living according to the law? This is a struggle that we have, and there's a mystery in the kingdom about Christian liberty. And Paul is now beginning to address this with the Corinthians. And this is where we want to put our attention. I'm going to back up a couple verses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, is where I want to start reading the passage. He's just talked about Christians. I don't know if you guys ever see this, if you've ever been in the body of Christ. Sometimes the church acts just like the culture. 
And we do things in immaturity because we don't know the Lord. We don't know how to relate to each other based in the kingdom. And so the Corinthians are doing, uh, 1 Corinthians is an exciting letter because it just shows how people are trying to mature and all the immature things we do in that process. Fight amongst each other, get in uh, illicit sexual relationships that we're not supposed to be in, suing each other. I mean, just a litany of what we would call the system of the world, and we're supposed to be liberated from this. And yet we still go back into it, we function it, we don't know how to break free from it. And Paul is addressing this. In verse 10 it says this. He's going through a category of now, look at all the people here. It says, nor thieves, nor covets, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor exhorters will inherit the kingdom of God. But such were you. And he's making a contrast statement here. You were washed. This is the idea that these are the things that we did before we knew Christ. Now, because we've been or justified, a washing has happened. We have literally been cleansed in the sight of the Lord... You were sanctified, which means we, this is the idea of holiness. You are set apart as his now. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. So that's the idea of a pronouncement is made over your life. And then in verse 12, the passage begins to make these statements. Now, when I was looking at it in the original language and just trying to understand, I understand what's being said here, but the contrast, Paul is actually giving these statements and then he's using an argument that's used in that day in the culture. And that's what this is. This is a third person in the Greek, which means this is a conversation that Paul is picking up as he's listening to people about Christian liberty. And it's this, all things are lawful for me. So that's the statement that the call, since I'm not under condemnation, then uh, I, everything is permissible for me, or I should be able to do all things. He's using an argument that the culture was using at that time as they heard the statement of Christian liberty. And then it says this, but not all things are expedient. That's what I have in my translations, or beneficial. And then he's stating it again. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of anything. And then verse 13, we'll finish it. Food for the belly and belly for the food, but God will bring nothing, both it and them. Bring to nothing, both it and them. And so what Paul is now beginning to address in this statement of the culture and beginning to talk about it, he's saying, well, everyone says, well, what is Christian liberty? It means I can go do anything. There's no condemnation anymore in Christ. And Paul's saying, yeah, but if you go do anything, you're going to find out that if you go back to that, there are some things that are not beneficial to you. There are things that are going to destroy you if you go back to them. Whether the law is over you or not, there are certain things that the law points to in wisdom and says, if you go do this, whether you're under the law or not, what is going to happen is it's going to destroy you because that was the purpose of the law is to put a boundary to make sure damage would not be done to you and I. So let's look at the passage and start working through it. Very specifically, all things are lawful for me, or it could be permissible, which means... Because of what we just talked about, the idea of the law and its effect in your life is really powerful here. It's saying, okay, so since, uh, think about it, in a sense, Paul is saying you have died to this system of walking with God. The, after Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead and the spirit comes among us and this whole idea of how to walk with God, God is saying, now I do not want to relate to you. And I want you to not relate to me based on requirements. Am I good enough for the Lord to be in relationship? He's, and that has been taken away. God now wants to relate to you in grace, which means how do I learn to walk with a person, not with a set of rules? Now, walking with a person is different than walking with a, with a set of rules. If you guys ever try to do this, now, if I do these three things, this person will like me. Or if I do these five things, I'll have a healthier relationship. And God is now coming to you and saying, I do not want to relate to you based on rules. I don't want you to talk to me about the rules. I want to be in a relationship with you. And so now he's beginning the idea 
because everything is permissible, now that Christian liberty has been entered into it, now the question becomes, based on my relationship with the Lord, should I be doing something? Should I be doing this? How will it affect my relationship? Now, the, the idea here of relationship in the Bible becomes very powerful for the body of Christ because as we move through the different epistles, Paul is now introducing, well, what kind of relationships has God given us? We see actually in Ephesians, one of the pictures of the church is you are the family of the Lord and you're also considered the bride of Christ. And so it's using relational language and relational concepts to say God is not relating to you based on being in a courtroom all the time. He's now relating to you as a family and as a bride. And because you are now how I live is unto him in a family family in a marriage context. God wants that to begin to settle into me. So I'm married to my wife, but everything I do, everything I do either enhances my relationship with my wife or it deters the relationship with my wife. And how do we know this? We know this by how we relate to each other. And that is what Paul is beginning to address here. He's saying, now look, because there's freedom, God has given me liberty so that now I can learn to walk in a healthy relationship with him. But doing whatever I want in every situation isn't what God has given me liberty to do. He's actually given me liberty to walk with him, to know him, to be in a relationship where I understand he's for me and that he loves me and because of those things, now I can approach him and expect to have healthy, whole relationship with God. And that is what is what we would call expedient or beneficial. It is not the law anymore that I stand before God. It is this, what brings the best wholeness to me with the Lord and in my life? That is the kind of relationship God is now starting to relate to me on. And then he brings it up again. He brings up the concept, he, he presents it when he says, now look, you can't just do everything you want now because the law isn't in your life. Christian liberty is now what is the best for you. Then he brings it up again. Everything is lawful for me. But I will not be brought under the, the power of anything. That's how it's translated some way. So when he brings it up again, the best way it could be said is, I will not be mastered by anything. Now this is interesting. It's using the word here, it's now going to bring the idea, if everything, if I have Christian liberty, now the question becomes, what am I under or what authority is in my life? Now we already found out that the law was actually how most people walked in their relationship with the Lord, and so you guys get it? If I'm relating to God by the law, I'm under the law. So the question becomes, what has control, or when we say Christian liberty, what level of what am I under when we say Christian liberty? Well, since we say we're under grace, freedom, living under grace isn't just a license to do whatever. It's actually the living under the grace of God so that I can actually live what we would say, it almost sounds kind of interesting to say this, live the way that God intended, which is for the best of my relationship with him and for my own life. So what I am mastered for, it's really interesting. The word what I am under or what I, has power over me, that word power is interesting because there are two words for power that's used or how power is ex uh, expressed in the New Testament. We have dunamis, which we get the word dynamite. It means an explosion of something. Uh, then we have the word authority, which this is actually the word for authority. It's amazing they translated it to power. That's what it means, but it actually means authority. So it's saying in the arena of authority, authority is always based on relationship. Re a word authority itself carries a relational concept to it. 
And so when I say that I am not mastered by anything and I don't have the authority of something over me, when I give myself to the power of just doing whatever I want, the, there's an, a, a spiritual authority that is released over me that I come under the power of. And now where Christ has promised me freedom, the enemy can actually have influence in my life to initiate me to live under the power of the flesh, even though I'm not under the law anymore, and now I'm in bondage again, even though I'm a Christian. And now my appetites control me. Well, now the Lord is trying to address this. He's trying to give us wisdom here. Look, food is for the body, and the body is for food, but Food itself does not master me. Uh, then he begins to go into sexuality. Look, I have sexuality, but I'm not mastered by it. Now, isn't that am amazing? He's saying, well, you're not under the law anymore, but look how you're, who you are as a person. Do your appetites actually control you, or are they brought under the power of grace so that they function properly, and yet you can relate to the Lord? This is actually not one of my funnest stories I ever get to tell. Um, when I came to the Lord, um, I had several problems with addictions. I knew the Lord Jesus Christ and yet struggled with what we would call common addictions. I wasn't strung out on drugs or any of that other stuff, and you're probably going to think this is ridiculous. But at a certain season of my life, I mainlined on Mountain Dew. I knew you guys would think that was funny after I said it. Because there are certain addictions in our culture that are acceptable. And we even have clubs that hang out with each other and we talk about how much it's fun to hang out with Jesus and yet be in our addiction because it's not considered a taboo in our culture. And so um, I literally drank, <laughs> to admit this kind of stuff, I drank uh, literally two liters of Mountain, several two liters of Mountain Dew every day. I'm glad you guys are responding this way. <laughs> now, you, that is awful. Uh, there's no getting around any of that. And how did I justify it? I'm not under the law. This makes me feel good. I'm following Jesus. I'm going to prayer meetings. I'm, doing, I'm faithfully leading people to the Lord. This is just something I enjoy. And I, periodically, I could sense the Spirit of the Lord trying to tell me, you need to stop this. And I remember trying to even justify it to the Lord. Why would I stop this? I'm not under the law. I even believed in the healing ministry. If I destroy my pancreas, I just kind of expect Jesus to restore it. I'm not under the law. <laughs> so how did the Lord help me with this? Taking Christian liberty too far. One day, my kids, my kids were like under 10 at this point. I have three children, two daughters and a son. And it's my birthday. And so what do you think they bought me for my birthday? Mountain Dew. I'm opening up a can of Mountain Dew, and I drank it, put it down on the table. My daughter picks this up, and they're making jokes with me. My daughter says, you know what we're going to do with this Mountain Dew can? We're going to bronze it. And then when Dad dies, we're going to put it on top of his tombstone and say, my father's God. <laughs> and she was just making a joke. I mean, she wasn't old enough to realize she just heard the Spirit of the Lord and pierced my heart. <laughs> After she said that, the Spirit of the Lord just landed on me. I have never, I don't know if you guys have ever come under uh, conviction, not condemnation, but conviction. Have any of you ever experienced that? This conviction hit my heart so intensely. I mean, I couldn't get away from it. I was like, what is that? So I, I just told everybody, uh, excuse me for a minute. I went downstairs into my office, my basement, uh, my office is in my basement. And I'm literally under the, the spirit of conviction and I'm going, wow, I don't, I don't get this. What's going on? I know I'm not being judged by whether I'm going to heaven or hell, but really this is intense. And the Lord started engaging me and basically said, Brian, your appetite has become an idol in your life now. And it so, has so gripped you 
that you're willing to compromise certain things to have this in your life. You are not in liberty, you are in bondage. That was not a fun morning, but it liberated me. So as I'm laying there actually gripping with it, I'm like, God, what is causing me to give myself to this and then live in deception and call it Christian liberty? And the Lord went to a situation in my life and he says, Brian, really, this is a dialogue the Lord is having me. What do you get from drinking this? Because all addiction in the flesh, there's a payoff or you would not do it. I said, well, I guess it just makes me feel I'm in control. How do you get that out of drinking Mountain Dew? And it makes me feel good. And he says, so, Brian, why do you need that to feel good? And then all of a sudden, we got to what we call the root of the problem. Not feeling in control of my life. In one area, I could do this place of feeling satisfied, even though I felt like everything in my soul and everything in my outward circumstances, I had no control over. And, I, and what I call Christian liberty, I went too far with it, and I, became, I came under the bondage of my flesh, and it was ruling me. After the Lord got to the core of the problem, I turned to him and I said, I cannot break free from this. You have got to help me. And the Lord engaged me with his love. See, that's the point of this idea of walking in Christian liberty. God deals with you in his love, and it's so powerful, it can break the power of anything in your life. After he engaged me with this, I got up off the ground, and for the first time in my life, here, I had, that's what I got for my birthday was Mountain Dew. I'm turning to go grab another one, and all of a sudden this desire that had absolute control over me. Guys, I used to dream about Mountain Dew. <laughs> I'm going to step into your world here in a minute, but just stay with me on mine, okay? I used to, uh, and I went to reach for another one, and I, that thing that I used to feel as I'd reach for it, I have control. I'm going to be satisfied. There wasn't there anymore. All of a sudden, the love of God was actually there. And guys, can you imagine? I took all my birthday gifts and poured them out in front of my kids. And that was the last time I ever picked up a Mountain Dew. Ever. It's more than 20 years ago now. In fact, uh, I, haven't even, I seriously have not ever tasted one. One time I was in, I think it was Africa, and they gave me a soda and I drank it. I thought, oh, this is disgusting. I just threw it on the ground. I never realized how addicted I was to that stuff. Now, why are, I'm telling you my silly Mountain Dew story, but what's the point of it? I really realized, based on study of Scripture, what it meant to not live under the law, but when I came to Christian liberty, I just thought, everything is permissible. Who cares if I have this addiction over here? It's acceptable in the culture. Are you guys ready? God loves you more than you just being caught in things. No matter how much the culture accepts certain things, there are certain things for you that are destroying you that the culture has no problem with you doing them. And God wants you free with him. I used to make jokes about coffee. Uh, no, I know no one ever drinks that stuff around here, but there are whole industries created so that you'll be addicted to black water. Some of you can drink it, some of it's beneficial, but some people are actually addicted to this stuff. Food, body, sexuality, all of them, fleshly things that are going on in people's lives, and we think, well, I'm in control of this stuff, but the Spirit of the Lord is saying, if you had to give that up, could you? If you cannot, anything that has to do with your appetites or how you walk with the Lord, if that has more priority than the Lord does in your life, you are under control of that, not with the Lord. Billy Graham said something. Uh, one time I was watching his sermons on television. This is when he was still alive and I was younger, and they used to just put it on regular television. And he said, you know, the question isn't, will I accept Christ? The question is, what is it I'm going to hold in my heart that will not walk with the Lord? And that's the question about the mystery of Christian liberty and authority. Anything that has authority over me or anything that has authority over you 
is affecting your relationship with him. Is that so important that Christ is not first? Let's pray. Lord, we just turn our attention to you now. Our lives, you've redeemed and you've given us liberty. So we ask that you would search our heart and mind and come to that place, if it's in us, Lord, Go to that place where things have more priority than you. You didn't create that kind of relationship with you. Bring a breaking of that over us. Don't let us be controlled but by thinking we are liberated to do whatever and then get caught, Lord. Set us free from the getting caught in fleshly desires. Let the freedom of our relationship be restored to us today. And let us walk in the things that you have created for us to live in. I just want to bless your name and thank you for liberty in your son. And the authority and living under your authority today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.